I'm going to start tonight by breaking the golden rule of public speaking. That rule is you never just read verbatim. You don't do it. Well, I'm going to break the rule because that's kind of the way I am for those of you that know me. Uh, I ran across this a while back uh, and it was something I was writing. Dr. Shotwell and I actually kicked around the idea of trying to write a book about me dying. Uh, it didn't go very far and now it's kind of ruined. Uh, <laughs> but I ran across this and this is something I wrote and this is the best way I know how to describe some of this to you. I wrote this at year two and it went on for eight more years. It was a ten year process, but this is year two. So if you'll excuse me and bear with me for just reading. It's going to be one of those nights, one of those nights that terminally ill people don't talk about. At least I don't think they talk about it. I've never read, found, nor heard conversations concerning tonight's like tonight will be. Tonight I will die. You just somehow know it. The time has come. I've known it all day long. I don't tell Sandra. She'll just stay awake all night worried, staring at me, trying to make me go to the hospital. I don't need that. I must fight this battle on my own. I must fight only if I choose to fight. It is as if God is giving me permission to die if I want to. Permission to come home. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Your work is done. As I lie down, I know the bed will become a battleground. A battleground of life or death. My life or death. I've faced nights like this before sometime for weeks on end. My body seems to be firing shots at my mind, bullets of pain, sickness, and fatigue. My mind cannot handle the barrage of senses it is receiving from my body. My mind seems only to have one choice, shut down, give up, die. I've been lucky enough to have never been in a war, but I imagine these nights must be similar to be caught in the crossfire of an insurmountable enemy. You either prepare to die or you prepare to fight. Tonight I will fight. Tonight I will live. The battle can be likened to a bad case of the flu. Aches, pains accompanied by fever and chills, just magnified about a hundred times. You can take Vicodin to the minute of the prescribed dosage, but even a level three narcotic will only numb the pain. If you don't pop one pill after the other, the pain is torturous. You can drug your body into a state of intoxication, but then you can't fight. Your mind cannot determine where the bullets are coming from. You don't know if you're nauseated. Are you going to throw up? Are you having a diarrhea attack? Can you even walk? Are your joints swollen so grossly due to the pain? Why is your back hurting so badly? Are your kidneys shutting down again? Are you awake? Have you died? Have you lost the battle? Is this death? Minutes become hours. Hours become a lifetime. You stare at the clock. Just four more hours and the night will be over. Four more hours and I will have lived. You can't stand. The weight of your own body is crushing to your legs and feet. Your calves ache with the burn of muscle acids being released. The balls of your feet are tender to the very touch of a finger. Your body is exhausted beyond comprehension, not just from a lack of sleep on this night, but from two years of fighting, two years of cheating death. It feels like the air itself is a weight upon you. You can't lie down. Your joints scream in pain when they become motionless. You constantly move all night. You move ever so slowly, just enough to change positions but not so much that you trigger an entire new set of senses. Your mind tries to filter all the data and impulses that are bombarding it. You can't process that much information. If you continue to take the pain medication, you lie in a state of confusion, a state of helplessness. Your mind can't decipher what part of your body needs the most help. The only way to fight is to endure the pain. The only way to live is to allow your body to suffer. The only way to survive the night is to pray. Pray for an answer from God. I appreciate you burying with me to do that, but that's what it was like. And that's what it was like at year two. And year two was a cakewalk, as I learned later on. 
Uh, we're going to talk about two things tonight, miracles and prayer. I became pretty good at prayer, in my opinion. Uh, but a disclaimer, I'm not a biblical scholar. I'm not a pastor. This is all just my opinion in my life, okay? So you won't make it out of here by seven. <laughs> I don't know any more than y'all do. I can't define a miracle, what it is. I can't define prayer, what magic words will get you a miracle. I don't know any of that. I don't know any more than y'all do. And I went through this for 10 years. But I knew, no, that you have to have miracles. They do exist. And as far as I'm concerned, prayer helps that. God can do anything He wants, anytime He wants, to whomever He wants. But from my perspective and my experience, I'll choose some prayer in there. Okay? I developed over the course of 10 years a philosophy. I had philosophy in college, and I'm pretty good at philosophy, and I like it, but I'm a simple guy. I couldn't do philosophy, so I developed a puzzle, what I called the puzzle of life, ultimately. Ooh, that worked. I redrew the puzzle multiple times, but this is eventually what I came up with, is this puzzle of life. So let's look at it for a minute. You see, we have four corners in the puzzle of life, and what I realized over 10 years is that just about anything that happens, you can put in one of these four corners. Take any event, any issue, any stage of life, and you can fit what's going on into one of those four corners. Now, each one of those corners may have a different priority at different stages of your life. If you're a child, you're probably not too worried about your career and financial. You know, if you're in school, in high school, in college, doing, studying for your career, Probably education is pretty important to you. So those corner pieces are going to go up and down in priority. But what I ultimately figured out is the centerpiece becomes the trick. God can be in your life, but if He's not the centerpiece of the puzzle, and if He is not always priority number one, the rest of your life will not work. And so I tried to draw that by making the tabs the little piece that snaps into the next piece of the puzzle, the little tabs you noticed are all on God. If you take God out of the center, which is what I did with the children a couple of weeks ago, I had a little puzzle and I took God out of the center. If you notice, if you do that, I thought y'all could do this in your mind, you didn't need a visual. If you do that, you notice the other pieces aren't connected in any way, fashion, or manner. If you take God out of the center, if you make Him one of the other corner pieces, the whole rest of your life just floats apart. Nothing stays together. Nothing works. And that's what I figured out after 10 years of suffering through this, is that God has to be the number one priority in your life. And if you do that, you can keep your whole life together. Just move the other corner pieces up and down in their level of priority. Now, I don't have it drawn this way yet, because actually I just thought of this the other day. I say this is about version 10. If you connect the corner pieces with kind of a little bit of an oval circle, you have a prayer circle. And that kind of brings us to my next topic. Your prayer circle can be you. It can be you and your spouse. It can be your family. It can be whoever. But what I found is that my prayer circle began to get larger and larger. You guys are examples of that. To be quite honest with you, Sandra and I didn't even tell anybody for about two months. It was just she and I. And then we finally told my family, and then we finally told a few close friends, and then ultimately, I, exactly like he said, I told Dr. Shotwell one Wednesday night, you know, hey, don't worry about it, but I'm going to die in about 12 months, you know, or sooner. And he did get kind of distant for a while. I, I had, didn't realize that, but interesting, he did. Uh, but our prayer circle grew. And here's what happens when you start trying to expand your prayer circle. See, it got bigger. Y'all were kind of the first big green of the circle. But then Sandra and one of her friends had a lady they had worked with for years, and this lady had moved to Australia. And so they were kind of keeping her informed of how that was going, how I was doing. And so her friend texts the lady in Australia one day to give her an update. She gets an answer back, and it says, I'm not sure who you were texting. I'm not sure what's going on, 
but I think you sent it to the wrong number. Turns out the lady had moved back to America. But the gentleman texted back and said, if you'd like to keep me informed, I sure would like to know. You see, I'm the pastor of a church in Australia, and we have about 5,000 members. And we'd like to add your, husband, your friend's husband to our prayer circle. And our prayer circle grew. And all of a sudden, I had people in Australia praying for me. Later on, Sandra's talking with her job here at, at Ash Creek as a children's ministry. She's talking to a, a gentleman up in New York. And he says, well, you know, I'm, I'm the minister of a church up here, and we'd love to add your husband to our prayer list. We have about 5,000 members. So we, apparently is the number. Dr. Shotwell is slacking off people. <laughs> I'm telling you. The number is 5,000. That's what we need to be shooting for. I think our five-year goal thing is coming up, so I'm just telling you. Uh, and so all of a sudden I had another fight. And literally, before it was over with, I had literally tens of thousands of people around the world praying for me. And that is amazing. The power of prayer is amazing. And that's one of the things I want you to walk away with tonight. Let me give you a quick example. For about three years, starting in 2009, I started really getting complicated things happening to me. They had to call in just a general surgeon in 2009 and do a procedure. And he looked at Sandra and he said, your husband will not live through this procedure. According to the books, the fatality books or mortality rate book or something, who knew there was such a book existed? You know, he's white male, he's 55 years old, he wait, you know. But according to him, there's a book. And according to the book, I would not live through the procedure. And if I did, I would die in recovery because I wasn't strong enough to live in recovery. You know, do you want to do it? Well, what if we don't do it? Well, he'll die probably in the next week. <laughs> so we did it. And I lived, and I recovered, and he couldn't believe it. Well, the same thing happened about two years later. Had another complication. They called him back in again. He looked at Sandra, told her the same story, and she just smiled and laughed. He grabbed her face in his hands, and he said, Listen, I know you believe in your God, your God, and I know you pray to him, but I am telling you he will not live this time. And she just smiled at him. Did the procedure. I lived through it. I recovered, and I went on. I want to say maybe three months, three or four months later, another issue happened. Called him in. He looked at Sandra, said he's going to die. She smiled, and he said, I know. All I can tell you is keep praying to that God. That's what prayer can do, and that's what people knowing you're praying can do. I don't know what's happened with that surgeon yet. He clearly was not a Christian at the time. He may still not be, and he may never be. But clearly, Sandra was able to plant a seed with him just by him knowing she was praying. And that's what a prayer circle can do. So I encourage you to have and increase your prayer circle. Uh, okay, March 29th, 2004. That's when life really got good. That's when what I consider the first miracle in my life happened. I had actually been sick for about a year previous to that. I'd gone to the hospital, the ER room, four or five times during that year. Lots of doctors, lots of tests, lots of diagnosis. Some, okay, maybe. Some really weird. Uh, for me, the best diagnosis that I enjoyed was the one where the doctor looked at Sandra and I sitting in the room and said, Mr. Hartnett, I've decided your wife is trying to poison you to death. <laughs> I thought, yeah, right. And then I thought, oh, wait a minute. Uh, we didn't see him after that, but I, I, you have to like that at least, right? Now, this whole year, I kept hearing one doctor's name. Every time his name came up, he's the best in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. You've got to get in to see him. So I tried to get in to see him. Here was the process. You had to submit all your medical records from every doctor for the last five years to a panel. The panel studied your case, made a decision. If they accepted your case, they'd contact you, 
and you could get in to see him in about six months. Really? How would you like your business to be that busy, you know? Well, I kind of said, nah, not going to do it, not worth it. Kept hearing his name over and over. On March 29th, 2004, my company had changed their insurance. We put me on Sandra's insurance. We said, okay, next time I'm going to a different hospital. I'm going to get new doctors. Going to have a new test run. We'll see what happens this time. Sure enough, it did. I walked into the hospital downtown with a 103.7 temperature. Still stands as the record to this day from what I know. Uh, I told Sandra I worked late, called her on the way home, said not feeling good, don't bother coming. She showed up about 15 minutes later, you know. Uh, they rushed me back, they ran a bunch of tests. I pretty much go comatose. I don't know what's going on at this point. They said, listen, Ms. Hartnett, we don't know what's going on. We can't figure this out. We're going to call in a specialist that we have on duty here tonight. The gentleman shows up, looks at Sandra and says, country draw, old guy, country draw, says, Ms. Hartnett, I reviewed the test. Sorry, I can't do country draws very well. <laughs> Not past the one I normally have. Uh, and he says, I got, you know, if I'm right, I've got bad news for you. Your husband has primary sclerosing cholangitis, PSC for short. He said, and at the stage he has, he probably won't live for the next 12 months. Now, why I consider this a miracle, getting diagnosed with a terminal illness, that doctor, the best in the Metroplex, that I couldn't get in to see, was the specialist on call that night. And all of a sudden, I was his patient, just like that. Two or three weeks later, I called him up after I'd gotten out of the hospital, and I said, you know, Dr. Van Hartnett, well, actually, I called to make my, my follow-up appointment. He got on the phone. How many of your doctors actually get on the phone with you? He got on the phone. I said, you know, doctor, I'm calling to make an appointment so we can get together and figure out how to fight this thing. No answer. And finally, in that country draw, I said, well, Mr. Hartnett, I apologize my hesitancy, but to be honest with you, I didn't think you'd still be alive. Well, I met him, we embarked on 10 years worth of working together. He probably should have retired when I first met him, but he literally told me once he was not going to retire until I was either dead or had a transplant. So uh, that was the first miracle in my life. Uh, here's the interesting thing of the diagnosis of PSC. It's technically not a liver problem. It's a bile duct problem. It's my bile duct that was going to kill me. It just happens to kill the liver, and the liver is actually what you die of. But the problem was bile duct, and that becomes important later on. That's what this doctor figured out that nobody else could. So hang on to that, because it does come important. We're going to jump forward to about year nine, uh, year nine going through, through 10. In the 10th year, I was in the hospital 11 times out of 12 months. Sandra basically lived there. Y'all probably don't know that, but she lived in the hospital with me. She'd drive here every Sunday morning, every Wednesday night, every time she was supposed to be here, work here, run to the house, change clothes, shower, wash everything, drive back, and lived in the hospital with me. During that 12 months, she was told about seven to 10 times, we lost count, to be honest with you, seven to 10 times in 12 months that I wouldn't come out of the hospital, that I would die before I got out. And so that's how drastic it got, as Dr. Shotwell said, toward that last end. My last two hospital stays, I was going to die. There was no doubt about it. Uh, every visitor that came in, as much as some of y'all tried, you could see it on your face. You knew I was a goner. Uh, doctors, we could hear them whispering in the hall right outside my door. They were talking about He's gone, we can't save him. Uh, Dr. Shotwell couldn't even hide it. He's admitted to me later that he actually even started working on my funeral. Uh, even I, even I knew I was a goner. Wasn't, wasn't gonna happen. Only one person never lost faith, never lost hope, never quit praying, and that was my wife. She is an amazing person, and I can't be any more lucky than to be married to her. And as far as I'm concerned, that's a miracle because <laughs> I don't deserve it. I can tell you that. Uh, so that's what was happening toward the end. Uh, 
And then the day of the final miracle came. Uh, Friday night, about 8.30, some friends here at the church had just left the hospital room. They know who they are. They're here. I didn't get permission to use their name. So uh, they had left. Sandra and I are tucking in for the night as had become our ritual. We knew exactly how to handle the thing. We knew how to make a hospital room a home pretty easily by then. Uh, my cell phone rings. It's a blocked number from Dallas. Now, no offense, people, but I don't answer my cell phone if the number's blocked. And I certainly wasn't going to answer it when I'm in the hospital on a Friday night at 8.30, feeling like I did. But for some reason, I knew I had to answer the phone. So I did. So a lady on the no other end, who I don't remember what her name was, but she said, Mr. Hartnett, my name's so-and-so. I'm over here at this Dallas hospital. I see that you're on the liver transplant list, and well, we have a liver we'd like to offer you if you're interested in accepting it. <laughs> you know, it's Friday night, it's kind of late, we just tucked in, you know, no, nah, well, okay, we'll go ahead. It's been 10 years, I'm not sure I can last another 10. Uh, I really, to be honest, I haven't the slightest idea what happened after that. Uh, all I knew is people went into panic, chaotic mode, and Sandra just took over, and things started happening. Uh, they stuck me in an ambulance, transported me over to Dallas. Uh, all the way there, there was a car bumping the back of the ambulance. Turns out that was Sandra being so close to me because she didn't know where she was going in Dallas. Uh, <laughs> got us over to Dallas about 2, 3 o'clock that morning. Got us into a room. We kind of tucked in uh, within very long the doctor shows up. Uh, any of y'all remember the television sitcom in the 90s, Doogie Hauser, MD? Anybody remember that? You know, the whole comic part was, you know, the genius.